Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the Director for the Institute for Social Capital. I'm also the current President of the International Social Capital Association. So this, this session, this workshop is an introduction to social capital that's designed for researchers who are fairly new to the conference, uh, to, the, to the concept. Uh, anyone who wants to quickly learn about it, find out how to navigate the, the literature, um, what some of the pitfalls are, perhaps reflect deeply on what you might be able to do with the concept in your research. Uh, really just give you a quick quick uh, head start on the concept. Uh, and this is probably useful even if you're a fair way down the track of, of doing research on social capital. It may give you an opportunity to look back and reflect on perhaps how you're using the concept or how you might be able to, to conduct your research or, or in fact conduct a literature review or whatever it is uh, you might be doing with the concept. So this is the overview for the session. Uh, this first part obviously is, is being recorded uh, and then we'll have some, some discussion and we won't record that part so you can feel free to talk about your research. So we'll look at getting started with the concept and what the value of the concept is, perhaps encourage you to reflect on how you're using it in your research. We'll look at an understanding of the concept and of course there's many different meanings, but what are the similarities and how can we understand these different understandings or these different definitions within the context of each other? How can we make sense of the, the literature in a broad sense? We'll look at what some of the outcomes of social capital are because that helps us to focus on what social capital actually is. I'll outline what complicates the theory and give you a, at least one or, or two approaches to maybe understand how there's differences in the literature. I'll discuss some challenges of reading the literature and give you some pointers on how you might be able to navigate it a little bit more easily. And obviously some challenges of conducting research and how you can go about getting further support. So we'll dig straight into getting started with, with social capital. And as I'm sure you've already discovered, if you've uh, read some literature, it, it's a bit puzzling. Uh, it's a bit cumbersome, but it's, it is very intriguing. And overall, it implies that social relationships are valuable and important. So it says uh, that we can get value, that um, we can we can share, we can help, we can care, we can get information, we can get social introductions. There's a whole range of different benefits that can come from having social relationships and from being able to work with people collectively to achieve collective goals. And of course, this is not a, a new or a novel idea by any means. Human societies have, have only been able to exist because of the ability for humans to be able to work together. And if, if you go back to, uh, say, classical economics at the time of Adam Smith, then the idea that relationships were important and valuable was central to the way in which we thought about uh, economic exchanges and society and, and so forth. So it's not a new idea at all, but it has been, especially in the last 50 to 70 years, increasingly overlooked and undervalued by the way in which we do things in business and in society and in government and, and so forth. And the concept of social capital really comes back in to highlight those social and cultural processes. So for a lot of people, it's corrective to asocial ways of thinking. Uh, for a lot of the early scholars, they were quite uh, deliberately and purposefully looking to correct what was missing from neoclassical economic thinking that has increasingly permeated our organizations and politics and media and so many areas of, of modern life. And from the 1990s, it certainly sparked uh, extremely widespread interest in the concept and, and its popularity uh, speaks to it, to the perceived uh, need and usefulness of the concept. Um, it's, it's actually quite striking how popular the concept is um, I did a, a quick survey of, of Google Scholar. Since 1990, there's been about 127,000 publications uh, on, on, on social capital compared to something like uh, globalization, which is under 100,000. Uh, something like organizational culture was about 20,000. Uh, something like social norms was about 8,000. So we're talking 129, 130,000 publications on social capital. It's incredibly popular. Why? Well, clearly people think it can do something. Uh, it, clearly they think it's important as a need for it to communicate that importance of social relationships, of the ability to work together, of basically of having uh, the ability to, to have collective action. 
So it is so incredibly uh, complex. So when we, when every single different discipline in the social sciences are interested in this, uh, there's different levels of analysis, different context, and therefore there's different meanings and approaches. You know, if you're interested in economics and you're interested in the nature of exchanges, then you'll take a, a particular meaning and approach to what this, this capital is that we call social capital. But if you're interested in sociology or anthropology or psychology or the, all these different areas, then of course the meaning is going to be quite different. And if you're interested in individuals compared to groups or society as a whole, or you're interested in different contexts, all of this can result in quite different meanings of the concept and quite different conceptual approaches, which as I've made a note here, can be really quite confusing. Uh, reading the literature really requires an understanding of these different conceptual approaches. Otherwise, you'll, one, one moment you'll be reading about the configuration of networks, and the next moment you'll be reading about social norms and trust, and you might, might not be quite sure how these, these two quite different meanings relate to each other. And unfortunately, the, the literature is, uh, a lot of the literature is not great. You know, there are mismatch approaches that exist there where uh, authors have tried to combine uh, different definitions that uh, that really are very different in, in what it means in the same research. And that can be quite a challenge when you're then not only trying to make sense of the literature, but trying to make sense of uh, mismatch approaches that exist in the literature, which can create even more confusion. And of course, it's difficult to measure. This is an ongoing challenge, uh, not to say that it hasn't been measured. It most certainly has. There's, there's absolutely hundreds and hundreds of different approaches to measurement out there in the literature. Uh, some of them are really well thought out, and some of them have really been just thrown together. Um, and it's hard to tell which one's which and, and how you should go about measuring it for your particular uh, context. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how you might go about framing uh, the measurement in your research project. So getting, what's the value of the concept? So it's incredibly popular. People must want it to do something. They obviously see there's a need for it. And I think it, it comes down to this overlooked and undervalued part that, that social relationships just aren't um, emphasized. They're not valued. Um, and this is part of a recent trend to, to communicate what I've described here as non-economic value as capital. So traditionally, uh, capital was really the means of production, uh, but it's been expanded and the, the meaning of capital has changed over time. It's It's been expanded and changed and we had natural capital, human capital, intellectual capital, there's so many capitals now, cultural capital, institutional capital, um, emotional capital, I don't know, like any word you can think of just about, you can put capital after it and it's probably, probably someone's thought of it. And there's also other non-capital ways to try to communicate the value and importance of social relationships. So things like social impact or social value, I've seen a bit of literature recently uh, using the concept of social value or social investment or perhaps social capability. There's, there's a lot of terms here that people have tried using to communicate this. But social capital in terms of the popularity of the concept absolutely dominates and dwarfs all the others. Uh, by far. Um, and of course, the other thing that it can do is that it can provide a way of understanding and improving practice. So when we're, un when we're more aware of and understand the benefits and importance of uh, social relationships and sociability, then we can implement simple ways to improve it and we can uh, identify and avoid things that might be costly or damaging to that potential uh, for cooperative action and, and collective action. So then what is social capital? I mean, the easiest way is to look at the meaning of social and the meaning of capital, and that'll give us a bit of a hint about what it is. And certainly social implies that it relates to interactions between individuals. So if you're interested at the micro level, this might be social relationships, social interaction, you know, very tangible uh, interactions between people. Whereas at the macro level, you might be more interested in the nature of social organization, social structure, the way institutions uh, form and regulate human uh, behavior. And this is part of the source of the different meanings of social capital exist in the literature. 
And the capital part implies a, a potential, an ability, a capacity. You know, you can invest in it with an expectation of return, uh, that it permits uh, production or outcomes in the future, um, that it's basically valuable. You know, it's a, you can invest in it to produce a stock that produces a, a return or a flow, uh, can be maintained, appreciated, enhanced. You know, social capital has all of these kinds of characteristics. And we can easily understand that at an individual level because we can go out and form relationships. We can do favors for people. We can uh, develop goodwill. We can develop a positive reputation. And that investment results in a potential for us to be able to gain future benefit. And then at the group level, we, we can also understand that a group can form their structures. They can uh, re formulate rules. They can shape norms. They can get people together. They can, you know, and this same process which is an investment effectively, creates the potential for them to be able to engage in cooperation and collective action going forward. So we can understand it's capital. We can understand that it's social because it involves interactions between people. I think that's that's fundamental. But of course, the key point here is social capital is not what it does. You know, uh, physical capital is not the ability to, to transport people. It's the bus that transports people. You know, and this is true of all forms of capital. Social capital is not what it does. And, and we'll, we'll get into that a bit more. We'll see when we'll look at the logic structure and, and see how that works. So key question then is, what does it do? And if we can understand what it does, then that'll help us to understand a bit better what it actually is. So the most commonly cited outcomes include cooperation, collective action, information flows, social introduction, social support, actions based on trust, reciprocity, and various helping, uh, giving, caring types of actions. So there's a lot of different things in here. What do they all have in common? And what I would say is I'd describe them as social actions. So these are actions that we uh, perform that relate to or involve in some way other people. This is a broad category. And so social capital then facilitates, enables, encourages, it's the potential for social action to occur. I think it's also important to not ignore the intrinsic outcomes that are associated with that potential. So the, this is not necessarily an outcome, but this is the val a value such as psychological well-being. You know, the health literature, public health literature it, on social capital is very interested in the way in which social capital can facilitate these kinds of non-action based uh, values or outcomes of social capital. So if we dig into this a little bit more, um, there's a whole range of different social actions here that might potentially relate to social capital. I think it's useful to try to break them down and see, and see which ones are, perhaps are or perhaps aren't outcomes of social capital. So we could look at different modes of action. For example, acting with others. So this is where we're coordinating our action, we're cooperating in the pursuit of shared goals, and most organizations fall into this type. We bring people together to act together, to work together, to achieve some sort of a goal, and that's acting with others. So I think everybody would agree this is absolutely an outcome of social capital, no doubt. We then have a different type where it's actions that are towards others directly. So they involve, they impact, they accommodate. Uh, this could be helping and sharing and giving. We're not working necessarily towards the same goal, but our actions definitely do relate directly to other people. And I think just about everyone would agree this is absolutely an outcome of social capital. But then we get into some areas where it's, it's perhaps a little more questionable. So we have actions relating or affecting others indirectly. So this may be actions relating to common property resources or involving some sort of an externality. You know, is, for example, uh, recycling behavior, is that an outcome of social capital? It doesn't relate directly to another person, but it most certainly does have indirect uh, implications for other people. Uh, littering, you know, I gave, I'll give some examples here of what they may be. And these certainly could be outcomes of social capital, but we need to be clear about why they are, because they're not acting, they're not relating directly to others. They don't involve a direct interaction or exchange between two individuals. And then we have one final category, which is actions that are influenced by others. So these are things uh, like perhaps personal health or exercise actions, 
uh, patterns of media consumption, educational choices. Again, they don't involve a direct interaction between people, uh, but they are certainly uh, actions that are oriented towards others, you know, to, they're to meet expectations, they're to fulfill promises, they're to uh, live up to the expectations of those who are around us, perhaps they're influenced by, by others. So again, a little bit questionable, and we need to be clear if we think these are outcomes of social capital, why we think they are. So it's a useful little matrix, this, for thinking about the different outcomes and how they might relate to, to social capital. So let's unpack the meaning a little bit more. You know, the logic, logic of capital on the first row here is the investment or a byproduct of some sort of a process or activities creates the potential. This is what we're saying social capital is that can then provide some form of future benefits or returns. So the key questions is what creates the potential? What is the potential? And what are the outcomes? And well, we have some answers. We've just said really that the, the outcomes uh, are social actions. But we've got a big question mark here because this is really about why do humans act cooperatively? You know, this is the, one of the key questions across a lot of the social sciences. It's a bit of a puzzle still. We understand some aspects, we don't understand others. Um, and it's an area of continued interest. And because so many different disciplines have answers or some ideas about this question, therefore, we have lots of different meanings and definitions of social capital. And I think that's a really easy, useful way to think about the, the variety that exists in the literature as these different explanations for why humans act cooperatively. So then putting together a schema of social capital. This is simply taking the logic of social capital uh, and exploring a little bit more about that context and how it actually works. So we're saying it, it facilitates the actions of individuals that cont contributes towards future benefits. So let's look at some examples of what these actions may be. So the ones we, we mentioned before, cooperation and collective action, and they may contribute towards the things we're really interested in. So uh, resilience, perhaps, or improved productivity, or economic development, or disaster preparedness, or public health, all of these different overall future benefits or returns, these bigger outcomes that we're interested in, the actions of individuals are one of the things that contribute towards that. There's more things that, that contribute towards it. And the reason why I've put this asterisk here is because very, very importantly, Many of the outcomes involve mobilizing or activating or, or enhancing or transforming other forms of capital. So as such, it's not a panacea, you know, since it has limited capacity in the absence of these other forms of capital. You know, if, if I don't have a car, I can't, can't loan it to my friend. If, if I don't have the information, I can't share it with somebody. Uh, and so many, not all of them, but so many of the outcomes of social capital involve some form of a mobilization or activation or transformation of other forms of capital. And I think depending on your interests, this is absolutely essential for you to take into account. Um, otherwise, you might have fantastic, uh, strong relationships, but the other forms of capital just simply don't exist in the context to be activated. So another little diagram that could be useful to understand the literature. Um, we, we know it's an investment. We know it produces future returns. In the middle, there's a lot of different possible explanations about why people may uh, act socially towards others. So I've included many of them, perhaps not all of them, but many of the different ideas here that exist in the literature. Um, if you read the literature, you'll find ideas about homophily. For example, the tendency for people to associate with others who are like themselves. And when they do, they then form a potential to, to work together and, and act cooperatively. Uh, it might be network configuration. You know, the way in which people are connected to each other creates a potential for future benefits or returns. Uh, it may be social identity. For example, the way in which we feel a sense of belonging uh, to a particular group and therefore solidarity perhaps with that group can be a powerful influence on the nature of our actions toward people within and not necessarily positively towards people who are outside of, of that group. So this, this gives you a little bit of a picture about how there's many different um, explanations for what the potential actually is. Uh, and ideally, we need a way to, to coherently understand what 
what what it is for our particular research context that's most relevant and appropriate rather than trying to just include every possible explanation which makes research really uh, unmanageable when it's that broad. I'll return to this and talk about it a little bit more about how we might be able to make sense of all of these different things in a more systematic way. But we do need to think about the level of interest because chances are your research has a specific level of interest. You may be interested in interactions between individuals. Uh, for example, you might be interested in how uh, young people find employment so you're interested at the micro level about how the, their, their personal relationships and the way in which they can engage um, those personal relationships may produce the kind of outcome that you're interested in. Or you may be interested in an organization, whether it's a sporting team or a project or a company uh, or uh, simply a department or a team within a company, like whatever it might be, you might be interested in the way in which this organization uh, has a potential for the types of social actions that are most desirable to produce the outcomes the organization is interested in. Or it might be society. You might be interested in an entire community. Uh, and, and social capital is a bit different between at these different levels because social capital can exist between people. Now, as I mentioned, you know, I can build my own social capital by going and meeting people, getting to know people. But social capital also exists within groups and within communities and within entire societies. And one of the ways I think is really useful to think about this is to, to look at the individual and collective properties of social capital. And some of the literature will focus on the individual properties. Some will focus on just the collective properties. And some will look at both individual and collective properties. And I think over time, it, we've got to the point now where most people would agree that social capital has both individual and collective properties. So I've got a, a little table here we can use to understand what these, these different aspects may be. So the opportunity to, to uh, an ability to engage in social action really comes from connectedness. You know, if, if, if we're not connected to people, then we don't have the opportunity and ability to be able to act socially. You know, you, if you, you want to borrow a cup of sugar, if you don't know anybody, you could walk around on the street and randomly ask people. But you have a, a reduced ability, you have a reduced potential if you don't know people. So connectedness is really important. And at the individual level, this is all about social relationships. So having many connections with people from different backgrounds and positions and knowing about your connections, perhaps having memberships and roles, but having these types of social relationships and this is the individual properties. This is an individual having individual relationships, but there are also collective properties as well of connectedness. For example, social structures, organizations, groups, they actually connect people. They, they produce that ability and opportunity that extends beyond individual social relationships. So connectedness has both individual properties and uh, collective properties as well. And just because you know people doesn't mean they're necessarily going to help you. Um, they might think not trust you. They might uh, be suspicious. They You might not have any goodwill with them, whatever it might be. So I call this predispositions. So, you know, these are these values, attitudes, beliefs, emotions, understandings that then shape the nature of action when it does occur. So at the individual level, these are things like reputation, you know, trustworthiness, goodwill, obligations, roles and memberships interpersonal norms, all of these kinds of things that shape the nature of action that when it does occur. So it's very unlikely you'll find the term predispositions very much in the literature, but you will find things like relational embeddedness. You will find things like cognitive dimension of social capital or relational dimension of social capital. You'll find norms, you'll find trust, you'll find these individual components, but you won't necessarily find this, this broader term that brings them all together and makes sense of them under, under one heading. And of course, there are collective properties of predispositions as well. So these are things like social trust, which isn't, doesn't relate to a specific individual, but it's how people feel about other people within their group or society, whether they think they're trustworthy. Social norms can exist within individual relationships, but normally when we talk about social norms, 
we talk about something that exists uh, beyond individual relationships, you know, that apply broadly within a particular social group or a particular context within a society or a collective. Uh, expectations and shared goals, purpose, language codes, narratives, you know, all of these kinds of shared predispositions that shape the nature of action between individuals when they do, when it does occur. So both of these things, connectedness and predispositions are required. Uh, this has been well identified. Uh, Bob Putnam identified this, that just because people are connected doesn't mean that they're going to act pro-socially with each other. Uh, and so we need to have both of these to have strong social capital. So let's look at the theory. So it's complicated by the level of interest. So this brings together a few of the things that I've just been talking about. It's complicated by the level of interest, the uh, perspective of benefit, whether it's the individual who will benefit or the collective or perhaps both, uh, methodological requirements. Uh, some people are very focused on uh, it being quantifiable and observable and modelable and so forth. And also the theory of human experience, whether we're uh, self-interested, like uh, neoclassical economics, and uh, a lot of other variations of, of uh, economic theorizing as well, whether we're socially situated, whether instinctive, uh, whether it's normatively defined, and all of these things can, can complicate uh, all of the different definitional and conceptual approaches to social capital that exist out there. So there's been various attempts to try to make sense of these different conceptual approaches. Uh, for example, Woolcock and, uh, Woolcock and Narian uh, had these four different uh, conceptual approaches. Uh, Robert Lee had three, Phillips had two, uh, Fulkerson and, and Thompson had two. Um, so certainly there's more than one and there's lots of different ways we might think about what, uh, how we could categorize them. To be honest, they don't fit neatly into these boxes. You know, when I uh, did a large survey of the literature, I tried to put them into boxes and you'd be left scratching your head thinking, well, this is a little bit like this one and a little bit like this one, and I don't know where to put it. Um, so it's certainly not as easy as simply saying, yes, easily, this one's normative, this one's a resource, this one's synergy. Uh, it's far more complicated than that. But still, these sort of um, categories can be useful to understand that, that there are differences out there. So let's let's have a look at the common themes that exist in the literature. You know, we tend to see social networks coming up very, very frequently. We see social structure, social organization. We see trust and trustworthiness, uh, shared norms and sanctions, resources, benefits, cooperation. Uh, all of these things come up very, very frequently in the literature. So let's try and group them together and see if we can uh, identify some themes here. So networks and structures, this is about connectedness, you know, from the previous slide where I was talking about connectedness being one of the key aspects of, of social capital. Uh, trust and predispositions, uh, uh, shared norms, these are really predispositions, or we might describe it as sociability, perhaps, how sociable we are towards each other. Resources, well, that's a theme into itself. It's complicated and has a lot of different meanings. And really, uh, benefits and cooperation, these are, these are purely outcomes of social capital. Um, some of the literature mixes this up, what I would say mixes it up quite badly, uh, and includes the, some of these outcomes as being actually part of what social capital is. But from a, a logic point of view of what capital is, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So let's let's explore these conceptual approaches then a little bit more. So those that are focused on connectedness, uh, you know, networks and structures, uh, social structures, these are, are broadly termed the network approaches to social capital. And they're pretty easy to identify because they look at the configuration and the pattern of connections between individuals. The resource approach is certainly interested in connectedness because it's, it's the ability to mobilize resources through social networks. So it includes both the resources, which may be wealth and power and influence, uh, but the literature gets a little bit messy and maybe talks about material resources and money and so forth as potentially being resources as well. And then there's the, the normative, uh, normative or perhaps the communitarian approach. This is effectively following uh, Bob Putnam's approach that looks at the nature of sociability, but of course, still connectedness. You know, connectedness is central to, to all of the different approaches to social capital uh, because we need to have social relationships. That's kind of the 
core foundation of just about every meaning of, of social capital. So then we have at least these three uh, different conceptual approaches, but what about Bourdieu's approach? Um, doesn't seem to fit very neatly into any of those three. So I think we could actually call that a fourth approach that is quite distinctly different. And then there's a whole lot of other approaches that don't fit anywhere, and I'll just simply call them the heterodox approaches. So we'll talk about each of these five so that you can get an understanding a little bit more uh, of what they mean and who some of the key authors are. So when you're reading the literature and you see uh, certain citations, you can say, oh, that looks like the network approach because, for example, they're, they're citing uh, Ronald Burt. So the network approach uh, is about connections between individuals their social network that uh, produces benefits of some kind. So it tends to be focused on a network analysis or, or different structures. This is a very broad literature. It's difficult to say any one specific thing, but it tends to involve uh, mapping ties or, or identifying configurations, uh, analyzing directionality or reciprocity, uh, and attributing qualities to social structure, such as density or multiplexity or segregation or structural holes or leadership boundaries or bridges. You know, if you're seeing those kinds of terms coming up in the literature, it's probably related to or part of the network approach. Again, keeping in mind that there aren't clear, distinct boundaries between these different approaches, but at least the author is probably influenced by uh, the lit literature on network analysis. So key authors are really Ronald Burt and Mark Granovetta, but of course there's many other hundreds, if not thousands of other authors who have made significant contributions to this particular approach. The next one, resource approach. So social capital is, is resources mobilized through social networks is the most simple explanation for what this is. This is essentially a rebranding of social resource theory that Nan Lin pioneered throughout the 70s and 80s. He then published a book in the 1990s and called it Social Capital. So this is, uh, initially at least, was quite different to the other approaches to social capital. Since, of course, it's been merged and blended and blurred and uh, it's difficult to differentiate it now. Uh, originally, Nan Lin defined social resources as, as wealth and status and power. Uh, but since, as I mentioned, people have come to describe these resources as, as material resources, information, you know, things that are perhaps not social resources at all. Um, I've read some interesting things where potentially my car is social capital because I might loan it to a friend. I'm very confused. Um, but that's what I mean by this being quite broad and that the meaning of resources has become quite blurry and it's not particularly clear. So absolutely, the key author is Nan Lin as really the, the founder of this particular approach, bringing across social resource theory to social capital. But of course, since an awful lot of uh, scholars have worked on this area as well. Uh, next one, a normative approach, or could be called communitarian approach. Um, this really follows uh, James Coleman and, and Bob Putnam. Um, it looks at uh, values and beliefs, uh, focuses on culture and socialization and the internalization of norms and values. Uh, and it's really about the nature of social organization that influences positive and beneficial outcomes. So this is a, an incredibly uh, broad approach, it tends to focus on uh, obviously networks, but also norms and trust and perhaps solidarity and belonging and a, a wide variety of, of different things. Uh, initially, this was quite heavily based on rational choice theory coming out of economics, uh, but since it's uh, morphed and morphed and changed, and it's it's just about everything now. Uh, and key authors there, as I mentioned, Coleman and and Putnam. Uh, Bourdieu's approach uh, is distinctly different, in my opinion, to the rest of the literature. Because for him, social capital enables a person to exert power on the group or individual who mobilizes the resources. So this is part of a, a pretty well-developed theoretical project that looks at capital not just being economic and that social exchanges are not just purely self-interested and the need to encompass capital and profit in all their forms. So he emphasizes the structural constraints and unequal access to institutional resources based on class, gender, and race, and his approach is grounded in theories of social re reproduction and symbolic power. 
So his work is based on con his other concepts, such as habitus and fields, which are rich sociological concepts that are not based on rational choice theory. But a lot of authors following him have cited his work, but ignored his rich sociological foundations. And I think it's a real shame that they have done that. Uh, his work was on social capital was relatively undeveloped because it was part of his, his wider uh, theoretical work on various forms of capital, and it was towards the end of his career. And I'm, I'm not, I haven't read anything that meaningfully takes his work forward while still embracing his rich uh, sociological theoretical foundations. A lot of people have certainly uh, taken his work forward, but in quite what I would describe as quite different directions. So Bourdieu obviously would be the key author here. I think it, it, it goes without saying. And then these, these heterodox approaches, so hugely varied, vastly different. They don't necessarily fit into the, any of the other categories, and they can be quite elusive and difficult to identify, but I've, I've put a few here. You know, uh, Adler and Kwong, for example, goodwill available to individuals and groups. So focusing on goodwill isn't about norms, and it isn't about networks so much. Of course, those are, are, rel are relevant concepts. Uh, Robertson and co-authors focusing on sympathy, and his work more recently is, is using empathy rather than the sympathy. And then there's psycholo other ones like psychological states and behavioral expectations and so forth that, that are, again, these sort of elusive and difficult to identify approaches that exist in the literature. So hopefully that little overview gives you a, a bit of an, a, a broad brush of, of when you're reading the literature, you'll, you'll see these different kinds of approaches and you'll see a lot of mix and matching going on as well between different approaches. It's not at all uncommon to find authors uh, citing several different definitions that have very different meanings and then simply proceed with their study without actually adopting one of them as the, as the one that they will use in their study. There's some pretty terrible uh, practices going on, unfortunately, in the literature. So the challenge then is, is all these different meanings, different theoretical foundations, different methods. It's a bit mixed and confused. Uh, there are lots of tautologies in the literature, which is simply a statement that is true by virtue of its logic, uh, logical form alone. You know, if, if social capital is uh, the, the, imp the, import the value of uh, social connectedness, and then we're going to look at whether or not it's important for something that involves social connectedness, then it's true by virtue of the statement and it's a tautology. And there's lots of these kinds of statements that exist in, in the literature. Uh, it can be quite difficult to read. There's some unjustified assumptions. I've said some, uh, lots might be more appropriate here. And different schools of thought use different language to describe the same or similar ideas. Uh, so this can be quite a challenge as well when you're reading the literature. Uh, I don't have any simple explanations for how you can get around that other than try to understand what they mean by the language that they're using, if you can do that. So what we have then is, uh, as I've presented in, in this session, we've got a logic schema, we've got the paradigm outline, we've got the individual and collective properties table, and we've got the conceptual approaches diagram, and all of these things can help you to, to make sense of what's going on and hopefully to read the literature and design your research in a way that can produce meaningful outcomes for you. So the simple logic of, of capital and, and what it does, separating it out, being clear about what the source is, what the, the form is, and what the outcomes are can be really helpful. Uh, making sense of the paradigm itself, focusing in on what is the potential, uh, and what is most relevant for your particular context. Uh, focusing in on uh, the, the level, whether it's the individual properties, collective properties, or both that are most relevant for your particular context, and which aspects of connectedness or, or predispositions, again, that's the term that I would use as different terms in the literature, uh, are going to be most relevant for your particular context. The different conceptual approaches that may exist as you're reading the literature, making sense of that. Um, so then really what you need to do is you need to come up with a definition and a conceptual approach. So I would encourage you to use something that already exists because there are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of different definitions. So I'd encourage you not to simply make up your own. Uh, find something that works for you that you believe is going to do the job and adopt that for your particular study. 
Um, it's, it's all well and good for me to talk about social capital like I have in these general terms. But if we're going to get into research, we need to be specific about what it is that we're actually saying the potential is. And if you can't do that, then it's going to be very difficult for you to design quality research. So it's really important. And when you're doing a literature review, um, try to keep it relevant to your definition and conceptual approach and achieve that circularity. You know, if you keep going off and chasing every different possible conceptual approach and definition that you would find in the literature, every different application area in the literature, you, you won't be able to complete it. You know, there are um, tens of hundreds of thousands of articles by now on social capital. You really do need to try to narrow in on the, the literature that is most relevant for you. So by identifying your definition, identifying your conceptual approach, being clear about what the potential is for your research will then help you to be able to filter the literature in a way that allows you to focus in on those things that are most relevant for you. When it comes to measurement, there are many different methods and there's no particular blueprint, but I think just about everybody agrees that it needs to be relevant for your context. You know, if you're measuring something that has individual properties, then you need to focus on those properties. You can't be using broad macro level uh, indicators to try to, to measure the individual properties that you're interested in. So it has to be relevant for, for context. Uh, social capital is generally accepted to be multidimensional, at least across those two dimensions of connectedness and, and predispositions but perhaps across a range of different areas as well. You know, the, the circle of the different reasons or explanations for human action, potentially there's multiple in there that are relevant for your context. So it's multidimensional. And of course, there's challenges with the availability of data. And we'll almost always need to use an indicator that is hopefully a good indicator of what it is we're actually interested in. Um, but try to limit the wild assumptions that exist in the literature. You know, I've read papers that claimed that uh, mobile phone ownership rates were an indicator of bridging social capital without actually establishing any kind of uh, causal link there and any or even any correlational link. Uh, so try to do a little better than that in when you're choosing your indicators. So when it comes to, to further support, uh, one thing I could suggest is, is membership in the International Social Capital Association. Uh, for students, it's rather affordable. If you're in a low-income country, it's especially affordable. Hopefully, the, the, rate, the, the dollar value is certainly a lot less. Uh, the association also has a free community platform. Regardless of whether you're a member or not, you're welcome to join that platform and get involved in, in the conversation. ISC also has a lot of different free events, uh, webinars, and uh, the research design and methods workshops that Dr. Beverly Sloan runs are fantastic. I'd uh, well recommend them for anyone who's doing research. And there's also the Institute for Social Capital, which is, is my organization, also has a lot of resources and online courses. Uh, in fact, we're starting a, a three-week um, uh, interactive course next week, if you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, the pricing is pretty low and there are scholarships available if you if you need some additional financial support for it. Uh, this is really very similar to the the introduction of the nine modules, the, the, the first of nine modules, uh, this, this session that I've run uh, today. So if you're interested in that, jump on to socialcapitalresearch.com, uh, jump over to the online training section and, and check it out or, or get in touch with me. So that's the presentation portion. I'll stop the recording now and we'll get into a few 